All right. Hello and welcome to my master's thesis presentation. Um, the recording was uh, failed during my original presentation, so I'm just going to record it here now. Um, so uh, my name is Oscar Osprink. Um, I have done the thesis on the update commander, uh, a library for incremental historical updates for complex data. Um, yeah, thanks to my reviewer Raz and my supervisor Adam, you have been uh, of great help. So, um, a bit of an outline, we'll have an introduction on the thesis and the project, some background knowledge on incremental computing and uh, data pipelines. Then we will go into library design uh, before moving on to some example data and a demonstration on how the library works. Uh, then we will see experiments uh, that were run to evaluate the library performance and then go into some uh, conclusion. So um, we have sometimes in big data pipelines that um, we have serialized and nested data where we will have the need to transform this data into a format that is easier to work with. So it will be typically a tabular format. So if we change the transformation process, um, we may need to reprocess already transformed data. Um, so if we don't track the raw data uh, and the, the, the dependency between the raw data and the transformed data, um, the only choice is to perform a full recompute. Um, on the other hand, we can store unique dependency IDs for each record, but this requires uh, vast amounts of echo storage. So um, we have two questions in this thesis, basically. Um, can you leverage knowledge or frameworks from incremental computing to solve this problem? Um, and the main objective is to uh, see if it is possible to achieve fast and cheap updates in comparison to a total recompute using this library, yes. So if that slide made no sense, I added some additional ones. Um, let's see, we have uh, a bunch of IoT sensors around the world uh, sending serialized raw data to some storage. Uh, it could look basically like this uh, if we would use Apache Kafka. So we'll get some unique ID, um, some ingestion timestamp in milliseconds or in a date. Uh, here would be the raw serialized data. And a uh, topic could be something like the, the name of the unit or which sent it or something that's yeah, up for, um, uh, for, for the system to decide basically. So we would apply some transformation to this raw data to unfold it into tabular form, um, something like this. But if we, um, let's say we like uh, collect data like this for a few years and we discover that, okay, the temperature was never in Celsius. It was actually in Fahrenheit. What do we do? So maybe like, um, all of the data or just a few sections of the data would be affected by this, but we don't know which parts uh, because we have no dependencies. So we would have to do a total recompute. Um, the same could maybe be like we, we discovered that we actually always received more bytes than we thought. Um, we have some additional values um, and we need to account for this. Um, this is something that actually could happen. So. Um, yeah, let's go into some background on incremental computing. So the goal, um, this is a software concept, um, which aims to minimize the necessary time and computation needed to update the output of a program once its input changes. And there are two main approaches to this. We do dependency tracking, typically in uh, dependency graphs where during the program runtime, we build these dependency graphs, which uh, keep dependencies between data points and which uh, processes, uh, transformation uh, processes we used. Um, so whenever something changes, we can kind of map out what changes need to be made. 
then we have something called memoization, which is uh, basically caching the results of um, computations, um, which would typically be expensive or um, expensive to recalculate or are frequently used. Um, yeah, so most solutions in incremental computing are domain specific. Uh, the problem sounds quite simple, like we get some small changes to the input, we just need to out update the output, but this in the real world usually becomes quite, quite hard. But we can see solutions uh, or applications in compilers, we have machine learning and uh, in, uh, databases uh, amongst uh, others. So. Uh, as well as most solutions require large amounts of storage for dependencies or and or a high degree of memoization, which is a problem in big data engineering pipelines where um, we uh, like to uh, we handle uh, huge amounts of data. So incremental computing, a very simple example, we have three dependent cells. We update the first one and we have two cells that um, are now outdated and need recomputation, which in this example is pretty simple. Let's say we have a huge program with tens or hundreds of variables and millions of data points. And we change one variable. Um, right here in this picture, three variables uh, or three cells will be affected uh, out of maybe hundreds of thousands or millions. If we don't track data dependencies, um, we have no choice but to recompute everything. But if we would track unique IDs, that would be very expensive. So the target data pipeline for this project would be something of this form. Uh, we have external sources sending serialized data. Um, data ingestion with some messaging system like Apache Kafka. We have uh, intermediate storage of raw data, which of course is necessary if we want to reprocess the raw data, right? In some programs, you would typically not uh, store this. So um, then we have some parsing process uh, to unfold the raw data and transform it into some tabular, typically tabular form, but in this program, it will be tabular form. So the pipeline setup uh, that this, um, that is basically required for this, for the usage of this library is we have the raw data, um, ingested raw data. We have what we call the set of rules, which I'll come into more later, which is basically um, rules describe how to parse data under given conditions, basically. Uh, we have this parser, which takes these two as input and um, outputs this transform data into one or more tables. So uh, description of rules, um, which is quite central to this project. So rules dictate how data is parsed. Uh, they consist of a rule ID, a string of predicates and the name of a parsing specification. So as you can see here, these are um, rule predicates um, consisting of expressions, which in this project is limited to um, disjunctive normal form. So we could have some variable A, B, and C, and we can describe uh, which, um, which pieces of data, um, if, if a piece of data fulfills uh, this predicate, we want to parse it in a certain way that would be specified in the parsing specification. So predicates uh, kind of say which it locates which data we want to parse and the parsing specifications basically say how do we parse that data. Um, let's say we introduce another one or like a, a more of these rules with their own predicates. Um, this can introduce actually non-empty intersection between these rules. So in this case, we could see an intersection between that would be um, 10 and 5. And uh, this, um, this means that one piece of data 
will be parsed in two different ways. So firstly, one piece of data will be parsed twice and it will be parsed in two different ways, which is usually not something we want. Um, yeah, that's what we would call a rule overlap. So going back to this picture, um, to avoid having to uh, store unique IDs, um, the objective is to store the rule ID that was used in parsing. So instead of storing unique IDs for millions of rows, we would store maybe five, 10 or 20 unique values in the same column, which is quite a drastic difference in terms of storage uh, because it's, it can be efficiently compressed. So here we would store this row was parsed using rule ID or rule one and the raw data, um, each raw data point that was parsed with rule one would also have rule one in a column here. Um, okay, so let's go into the library design. Um, it's a library written in Scala, um, produces update commands, which are data objects or case objects, which contain the necessary information required to construct the necessary updates um, when there are changes made to the set of rules. Um, which would later on be translated into something that can be executed in a pipeline, something like we take this uh, data object and turn it into, um, or this case object and turn it into something like a SQL format string, which we can directly execute here in the parser. So it requires the maintenance of this association column in the raw data, which is something that we update um, for each raw data that we parse, uh, it will be parsed according to one rule, and then we will update the uh, the corresponding entry in the association column that this the data was parsed using this rule. Um, so the update commander receives a notification of uh, a rule set modification. So it receives a rule in the form of a case class. Um, and then a boolean signaling deprecation or introduction of this rule to the rule set. Um, yeah. So here's an overview of update commander where we have the input rule and the boolean. So let's say we, we have the rule set and we have a bunch of rules and we want to deprecate one of them saying that this, um, we no longer want to parse it in this fashion or for this, um, during this condition. So we call deprecate rule, which uh, would mean that we delete all data that was parsed using this rule. Um, and we do this in the tables and also um, clear the entries in the association column for those for the raw data that was parsed using this rule. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty fast. No fancy stuff there. So what if we add the rule uh, and we have no overlap to the existing rule set? So um, then we simply parse the raw data that fulfills the predicates according to um, the specification that the rule will contain. Um, but what if we have one or more overlaps in this rule? For this program, um, we will still allow rules to be added when uh, when there's an overlap. So for each overlap, however, we will have to deprecate uh, the overlapped rule um, because uh, we don't store unique IDs. We store the rule ID used in parsing. So if we would store unique IDs, we could find every piece of data that is located in this intersection. And then we can decide on what to do with it, basically. But we don't do that. We only store which rule was used in parsing. So this intersection can be big or small. Don't care. We can never know which piece of data is in this intersection. So we have to delete everything that was parsed in the old rule and then parse everything according to the old rule and the new rule. And anything in this intersection 
in this program will not be parsed. You can decide how yourself um, what to do with those um, test data. Um, but yeah, the, the intention is to not parse anything in here and just send some log message saying like this, um, this is no longer parsed and this is an intersection. So that means for each overlap, we deprecate any data parsed using that rule. And then we parse everything according to the same rule. Basically meaning that uh, when there's an overlap, we delete everything in old rule and we parse using uh, both rules. So we can go into the demonstration. Uh, we have some example data. This would be data ingested with something like Apache Kafka. And we have some Kafka ID, some ingestion timestamp in milliseconds. Uh, the data here is the raw serialized data. For this product, it is simply just a JSON string. Um, topic would be um, some example names for just some sensors. And the rule ID would be uh, or so some measurements, I mean, so rule ID here is the association column. The data looks something like this. We have some accelerometer values and some gyroscope values, um, which are just uh, random uniform values. OK, so let's start with these initial rules. We have rule one um, simply containing ingestion timestamp between 0 and 300. And anything that fulfills this predicate will be parsed using parse specification one. Um, in this program, this simply means that we will select a few columns and put it into table one. And parse spec two will just say select a few other columns and put in table two. But this could in the real world typically be like the file name of some description, like a JSON path or JAML file that will um, actually parse it using in some way. Um, okay, so let's uh, do a clean run and parse everything according to these two rules. We will see that the rule ID column here, um, the first three entries or records will fulfill the predicate of rule one, and the uh, record four to six uh, fulfills the predicates of rule two. Uh, we put uh, rule one values into table one and rule two into table two. Pretty straightforward. So we introduce rule three with the following predicates from 900 to 1000 for ingestion timestamp. It will be parsed using parse specification one. Um, we see that we change the association column value here in the bottom. Um, and this raw data here is parsed into uh, this format in table uh, one. And it was parsed using rule three. Pretty straightforward again, um, but what if we introduce a rule with an overlap to the rule set? So rule four, we say we have ingestion timestamp between 400 and 700 and parse it using parse specification two. Um, and this overlaps with rule two um, between 300 and 600. Oh, sorry, not between 300 and 600. It, it's rule two that has this uh, range in interest and timestamp. We get an overlap uh, between 400 and 600, basically. So the records with, which has ingestion timestamp between 400 and 600, which would be record five and six, those are now overlaps, or those are contained within the overlap. But we will here delete everything in table two, which looked like this, we will have to delete all these pieces of data from rule two and try to reparse it. But record five and six will not be parsed. It will not end up in the in table two. So it will only be record four and record seven, which will be parsed and end up in table two. So this would basically look, um, we take um, the update commands that were produced in this scenario uh, might be easier to follow along. We would uh, produce these commands. So we would delete from iceberg table one, where rule ID is rule two, the same for rule two, uh, or table two, I mean. And we would update the association column and set to null, where rule ID is rule two. 
then we would select from the raw data and parse everything according to the new rule and the old rule. Yes. So we have some experiment results. Um, we're running Apache Spark in a Docker container with six gigabytes of RAM. Data sets of sizes 1 megabyte, 10 megabyte, 100 megabyte, and 1 gigabyte. And those are just 10 multiples of each other. So it's basically the same or very similar data. Um, we have this raw parquet data loaded into iceberg tables before each clean run. Uh, there's seven initial rules with 11% uh, of raw data uh, for each rule. Um, so we have some data as well that does not contain, that is not contained in any rule. Now uh, we partition only on rule ID. Um, we have three parsing specifications, which basically say, just take these columns and put it in one of three tables. And the results are compared to the uh, corresponding total recompute time, because that's what we want to evaluate. So these are the conducted experiments. Um, we have no overlap add, where we simply introduce a rule to the rule set that has no overlap uh, to any existing rules. So we simply parse the data according to that rule. We have deprecate one rule. We simply want to um, yeah, deprecate the rule from the rule set and delete the data that was parsed using that rule. Uh, there's partial overlap add, so we basically introduce a new rule that partially overlaps with the old rule. So we will have to delete everything in the old rule, uh, we will reparse everything with the old rule, parse everything with the new rule, and everything in the, in the intersection will not be parsed. Um, the other two are, are basically uh, trying to test uh, more stress test the update command. So, uh, we come, uh, have this experiment for complete overlap add, where the old rule and the new rule completely overlap. We would basically delete every piece of data uh, parsed with the old rule. We will try to reparse all of it, but everything is in overlap, so we will not parse anything. And then we have this minor three rules overlap, um, where we introduce a rule which is um, contains like 10% uh, of the raw data of three rules. Um, but we will still have to delete everything that was parsed using rule one, rule two, and rule three, because we don't know where this intersection or where the data of this intersection is. So we will basically delete everything parsed according to three rules and reparse almost all of it into the exact same state. Uh, which is very inefficient. So this is basically like probably the weakness of the this library. Um, so let's start looking at the total recomputation times. Uh, we can see that they scale quite linearly after 10 megabyte. We may have some overhead. Um, we see the deprecate rule parses um, it, it does parse less data and we see that it's also faster than uh, the others. So the main program seems to perform as expected. Um, looking at the update command execution times for the experiments that we talked about, we see better scaling as size increases, or we can say that there's less overhead. Um, we have see that the standard operations, which would be just the no overlap add rule and the deprecate rule. Basically, we don't mess with any overlaps. That would be the standard operations. And those perform quite well. Um, and we see that the minor three rules overlap is um, the slowest out of all of them. Um, so looking at the only the one gigabyte um, data set, we see again, standard operations perform uh, well, uh, like uh, compared to the recompute. Um, again, minor overlaps are slow, uh, which is 
so far the only uh, experiment which performs worse than the recompute. So we can break down the update command execution into stages where deletion here would basically be um, it would be uh, updating the um, updating the association column once you delete data basically so setting it um, setting it to null after deletions of data um, so deleting from the transform table themselves is super quick because it's partitioned it's always almost always uh, sub one second so it's not included so we have deletion time which which is updating the association column after deleting data and then we have parsing uh, which is parsing the data that is selected and then we have update column here which is uh, after data is parsed we need to update the raw data uh, to say which rule was used in parsing. Um, so updating the column here, we can see it's very slow. It's, it's, it's above um, half of the total execution time. Um, and I said here, this is a like a byproduct of the pipeline design. Uh, this is not part of the update commander inherently, right? So um, that's, that's just... Um, a requirement to be able to run the update commander is updating this column. If you can do this more efficiently, that's, um, that's of course great. So let's try increasing the affected data, just looking at the no overlap add rule case. Um, so we add a rule with no uh, overlap. Uh, we can see um, between 26 and 34%, uh, we, um, we start to perform worse than the total recompute. So, um, if we if we want to be able, like use this for use this rule system and the update commander for big rule updates, we start to see maybe all of the overhead required is is uh, starting to catch up, and it's no longer worth it to use it. Um, so conclusion. Uh, update commander proved effective on standard rule set modifications for the 11% of the total late set. Um, and this might also be a bit of the intended behavior of this uh, library. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's very promising. It's less effective and less useful with several minor overlaps and also with just overlaps basically. Um, so that's something you really have to evaluate. Like, is this, um, do you want the, these rule overlaps to be a part of your pipeline and parsing process? Like you could, you could stop this before uh, they're actually introduced. So that's something to consider. Um, but as a rule manager, uh, it has proved uh, effective. So it's a successful proof of concept where we group data using rule ID instead of unique IDs. And uh, there's no, like, um, this, the thesis and the presentation didn't show, like, exact numbers for the storage saved. But I can now, like, unofficially say that you store, um, it's, um, if you take a 100 megabyte data set, or you take the 100 megabyte data set that was used in these experiments, and you add an additional raw ID column, that is basically... There would be 43 to 45 megabytes uh, extra. But if you do it just with a rule ID column that can be officially compressed, it would be two megabytes. And you would have to add this raw, this, um, um, you might have to add this uh, column, um, or let's say like this. Um, each piece of raw data might be parsed into several tables. So we might grow um, like even more inefficient to use the unique IDs uh, storage wise. Um, yeah, so there's lots of potential for future work. Um, of course, you can test this in a more realistic pipeline with like actual realistic parsing. 
the only parsing here was deserializing a JSON string and just selecting a few columns. Uh, yeah. Um, you can, of course, work on optimizing the Spark program, more partitioning, more sorting, especially to improve this uh, update column time. So this was only partitioned on rule ID. You could do more partitioning, more sorting to probably drastically improve this performance. Uh, you can also do some cost analysis to see like what in, the, in a business case, how much could this save, uh, especially for your, own, uh, for your own use case. But in the experiments that were conducted and the pipeline that um, the example pipeline, this, this could actually be quite effective. So yeah, thanks for uh, listening. And uh, the repository for update commander can be seen here. Um, in this link, uh, you can of course reach out to me if you have any questions. Um, and there's a readme here, you have some example, um, example experiments. So yeah, feel free to test it out. And uh, yeah, thanks for listening. Yeah.